Hello, everyone. Oh, hi. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. I'll be there in just a moment. Just getting Thank things set up Thanks. here, okay? Sure. How are you, Anne? It's Lois. I know it's Lois. Oh. I How are you? I your voice, too. I haven't spoken to you in ages. Like How yesterday? Are you, and I How speak. Are you, Hello, hello, Elaine. Uh, oh, and, and can I see you too? Oh, gosh. And you're lying down. I'm on my bed and I've got my feet up and yeah. No, I'm, I'm sitting up at, at my table so I can get a good view of everybody. Oh. I'm, I'm oh, sitting at my, at my lunch table. <laughs> but well, I, I don't think that's I only have one table, but I watched a uh, a wonderful uh, webinar uh, earlier for an hour, a wonderful one on privacy, American Jewish public relations on uh, privacy in in doing uh, it, it, the extent to which it's a, a, pro a problem um, when you do contact uh, uh, co contacting the the virus contacting mm. that they're doing. Uh, so there was a. I watched a wonderful program last night on Channel Thirteen about yeah. anti-Semitism. Yeah. In, in France. Yeah. Oh my God! It was so frightening. Yeah. Well, th that's that's a whole long story and long history because uh and a lot of it goes from north africa and right. algeria um, all right so so uh nice to be back with you again and to be able to continue this lecture series on inequality rising and uh we're, we're able to go into a great deal of depth i i think um we're really plumbing some very important details in the study of inequality. And today actually marks a pretty important transition in our course. Up until this point, we've been talking mainly about the economic causes and effects of inequality. And of course, when I talk about inequality, I'm primarily talking about social or economic inequality, inequality that has to do with unequal income and unequal wealth. But as we'll start to examine today, the effects of inequality are not exclusively or even primarily economic. That, that in many respects, what inequality does to people and to a society is in no way limited to its economic effects. And, and so I'm, I'm going to discuss a, a, a subject with you today, which in a sense is a, a, a grim topic. Uh, and the subject is what's called deaths of despair. And this is a, a topic, the way of formulating this idea uh, that was coined by an economist at Princeton University named Anne Case. She actually collaborated uh, on this research with her husband, Angus Deaton. Angus Deaton, Sir Angus Deaton, is a Nobel Prize winning economist. They both teach at Princeton University. They are both among the most esteemed economists in the profession. And their book, uh, which was preceded about five years earlier by an article, uh, was just published uh, this March, so just a, a couple months ago, and was one of the most widely anticipated books in economics, I think, of the last five years. Um, and, and I want to, to get into it, but before I do, um, I want to give you a little overview of what we're going to be talking about today and a little bit of an update in terms of what's happening in the economy with regards to inequality. So, um, to, to, to give you a sense of why I say today's an important transition in the course, it's because we're going to be shifting perspectives from a purely economic to a more um, sociological and psychological perspective. And as you will see, 
Uh, I, I'm going to be interested in drawing on the work of Charles Tilley. One of the, the central concepts he introduces is the idea of durable inequalities. And, and, and so um, if inequality was purely economic, just inequality in income and wealth, you might think that it would vary generation to generation, that, that this generation's wealthy might be the next generation's middle class, this generation's poor might be the next generation's wealthy. But uh, that doesn't tend to happen. And, and so one of the questions to think through is how do those who currently have privileged access to resources consolidate control over those resources? And, and to really answer that question, we need more than economic theory. We need sociological, psychological theory. And then we will we'll spend a lot of time, this is going to be the main topic um, for today, looking at this just published book on deaths of despair. Just so you know what I'm talking about from the outset, deaths of despair uh, is, is this term and case coined, and, and now Case and Deaton have spent a lot of time researching, that refers to the idea that a certain group of Americans has actually seen their life expectancy fall over the last 20 years. And that group is white working class Americans, especially white working class Americans 45 years or older. And the main thing that is contributing to their increased mortality, their decreased life expectancy, and by the way, the decrease in life expectancy among this one group is dragging the life expectancy of our entire country down. Well, you, you'll see in a few minutes that uh, for the first time in American history, life expectancy is not increasing in this country. And that is because of what is happening with the white working class, and it's primarily deaths of despair. Deaths of despair refer to people who die as a result of suicide, drug overdose, alcoholism and its associated diseases. And just in the book, not in the original article, Case and Deaton have added certain kinds of heart disease that seem to be highly correlated with forms of social stress. And, and, and their suggestion, my suggestion as well, is that all of these deaths are um, strongly correlated with increased social stress. And it's, so it's not just economic stress. It's not just that it's harder to pay the bills. It's also the stress associated with the idea that your standing in this society is under threat, that you no longer can view yourself as a fully equal, fully contributing member. And we'll, we'll talk about the economic bases, but the social implications of that when we get into that point. And then I'm going to spend some more time really drilling down uh, on uh, what happened with the white working class and, and why it is that in the middle and the last, the, well, the, the post-war period in the United States, the white working class um, really felt socially included and respectable, if you will, and, and, and then what happened when the reasons for their social standing were pulled out from under them. And then if there's time, I will introduce you to the next work, which is a work by a couple uh, public health researchers, epidemiologists, uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, their new book, The Inner Level. That'll be mostly next week. But, but first, I, I wanna give you a little bit of information about what's happening economically. Mm. There is a tiny little bit of, of good news in this diagram, and that is, as you can see, um, the number of new unemployment claims has been going down fairly consistently for five weeks now. Um, that is better than a scenario in which they were going up and up and up. But I would point out to you, as we've talked about in the past, that we're now dealing with a number, over 40 million unemployment claims filed in the last 10 weeks. That means essentially 
one in four American workers has filed for unemployment. And we're dealing with levels of unemployment that absolutely dwarf any recession in the post-war period, including the worst recession on record, which is the recession in 2007 to 2009. Um, what we have right now is figures that can only be compared with the Great Depression. And so what seems clear is that we are in the, in the grips of a major economic contraction. Whether it's better to refer to it as a recession or a depression, I'm not sure. There are technical definitions of each. We don't have enough data, enough information. Generally speaking, we don't make these judgments till six months to a year after the fact. But what is clear is that this is really unprecedented in both the rapidity and the depth of the damage, right? So if, if you look at what was happening in 2007, 2008, a gradual uptick in unemployment claims. If you look at what happened to us, right, we just fell off a cliff in March of this year, and we've been falling ever since. Um, and, and I just want to point out to you, uh, how long is it going to take for us to come back? This is guesswork, but we can look at the best guesses. This is a survey done of, I believe it's uh, about 80 leading economists. And uh, what we find is that no one believes that there will be a f economic recovery this year that, that, that will get us back to where we were before the crisis. That, that would be the so-called V-shaped recovery. We go down sharply, we come back up sharply. Um, and uh, as opposed to that, uh, the estimates then will be the first half of next year. That's actually a minority of economists. Second half of next year, first half of the following year, second half of the following year, or later than the second half of the following year. And as you can see, the dominant opinion is that it'll be not until the beginning of 2023 at the earliest that we will have recovered. And, and, and you can understand that given the depth and rapidity of this crisis and given the fact that it does appear that the coronavirus, although um, suppressed currently, right? And then and, and the mortality levels have come down, the transmission rate has come down, certainly has not been contained. And until there is either effective therapy or um, an effective um, treatment, so some way to prevent us from being so susceptible to it, there will be ongoing waves and lack of trust, and that's gonna to continue to hamper the economy. Um, and, and so then you can also see if, if, if we take you know, unemployment rate falling below 10% to be a, a, a benchmark of, of beginning to get this um, under control. You can see that nobody thinks that this is going to happen uh, in the coming quarters, uh, beginning all the way, uh, well, in, in the present, some people think it might happen next quarter or the final quarter of this year but most of the economists think it's going to happen not until around halfway through next year. And so the, the big topic that we've been talking about together is how to understand inequality in the United States today. And I've tried to present you with considerable evidence that we've become a much more unequal society and that the coronavirus is attacking the fault lines that that inequality has opened up, that it's exacerbating that inequality. Recent estimates are that 40% of the jobs that we've lost will not come back. Right? And so this is going to considerably exacerbate that inequality. People are already predicting, predicting an avalanche of evictions in the second half of this year, absolutely swelling problems of 
homelessness in American cities, especially expensive American cities like New York City, where you are already seeing roughly half the population spending more than half of its income on rent, right? You lose one job in a family like that and you're sunk. And, and, and so um, part of the reason to understand this in as careful and precise a way as we can is to figure out what to do about it. And I do have to say that I am cautiously hopeful that the extent of the devastation that this pandemic and the economic contraction it's triggered have caused, combined with the spotlight it's shined on the inequalities in our society, whether we look at the race or the economic conditions of the nurses or the first responders, or if we look at the people who are helping us all to get through this, right? The, the people who work in a community like yours or the people who deliver goods to our doors or the people who are staffing our grocery stores and running a much higher risk of contracting the disease because they're going to work so the rest of us can be safer. Um, we see American inequality embodied clearly on display. And, and so my hope is that when we look at this uh, predictions about what's going to happen in the long term, we look at what we have seen over the last couple of months, we begin to recognize that this is not a country that has a fair distribution of income or wealth or health or risks. And, and, and I do hope that we will perhaps begin to change our political conversation and begin to ask what is it we can do both to help us to recover from the current contraction, but also to help us restore a fairer economy. And, and, and so with that in mind, I now want to transition to um, some more, uh, a, 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 a different perspective. You may remember um, last week, um, we finished our discussion of uh, Branko Milanovic's global inequality, in which he uh, gave us really detailed historical information about the kinds of causes that lead to rising inequality and the kinds of economic forces that sometimes also trigger declining inequality. Today and, and in our next session, I want to look at more sociological and psychological causes. And, and the, the books, the kinds of books I'm going to be drawing on, I've already mentioned, Deaths of Despair by Anne Case and Angus Deaton. This book, Durable Inequality by Charles Tilley, a great American sociologist who taught at Columbia University for probably 30 years, passed away a little bit less than a decade ago. This is a book that's about 20 years old, and it's a wonderful study of how it is that um, once a group establishes an economic monopoly, and it doesn't have to be a, a, a monopoly on a particularly valuable good. He, he looks at Koreans who own bodegos in New York cities, in New York City, how once that's been established, the group tries to close access to it so only it gets access to it how exactly does that work and then an, a, a, another uh, very important work in contemporary social psychology by claude Steele at uc berkeley uh formerly at stanford formerly at columbia his book is called whistling vivaldi uh, and I'll, I'll tell you just very briefly where the title comes from. It's about an African-American man studying at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park, Chicago, who found when he walked down the street, uh, many white people would cross the street and it made him uncomfortable. This is probably 35, 40 years ago, that, that he was intimidating people. He was a large, strong man. He also had a capacity to whistle complex um, classical music very well. And, and so he started whistling Vivaldi uh, 
when he was walking down the streets of Chicago. And he found that if he was whistling classical music, that white people relaxed and stopped crossing the streets. And, 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 and so this is, an, in essence, a, a book about stereotypes and what stereotypes do to us, how they get under our skin and inside our heads. And in a sense, that's a, a, a large part of what we will be talking about now that we're shifting from an economic to a more psychological and sociological perspective. Um, so let me talk at first about Case and Deaton's basic idea of deaths of despair. And, and this is um, uh, a diagram that in a sense and case uh, detected early on and led to this research. And, and let me just give you a little bit of a background here. Anne Case is, is an economist. She teaches at Princeton University. She's done some very important work. It's one of the top economics departments in the country. And um, she, I guess around a decade ago, developed severe back pain. And so she started to do research into what uh, public health officials call morbidity, which is, is right different from mortality. Morbidity is, is, is not uh, death rates, but pain rates, rates of pain and disease. And, and she was interested to figure out how is pain distributed in our society? And she came to a shocking finding, which is that white working class Americans report six times the level of chronic pain as college educated Americans, whether they're black or white. And, and, and it, it, very strange, right? What is it about them that would lead white working class Americans to be in much more pain? And uh, this, of course, coincides with the opioid epidemic, a, a topic we've talked a little bit about together before. Um, the idea that um, Purdue Pharma with oxycodone and a number of other pharmaceutical companies made billions of dollars marking marketing new kinds of opioid pain medication that, that very often was abused, resulted in addictions, resulted in overdoses, ruined lives, and in fact, deaths. And, and, and she was interested in, well, maybe there really is a higher incidence of physical pain here. And maybe that's part of the reason that there's a higher incidence of opioid addiction. This is the, the inquiry that got her started. And she came to the conclusion based on medical research. And, and the, the term that comes to mind is psychosomatic, but I, I don't like the term, she doesn't like the term because it seems to imply it's all in your head, uh, right? But what contemporary medical research tells us is that people who suffer rapid downward economic mobility. People who expected that they would be economically secure and instead find themselves economically precarious. Those people uh, turn out to be much more susceptible to pain, much more frequently injured, much sicker, much more likely to have a shortened lifespan than the rest of us. And when I say I don't like the term psychosomatic, it's because it's not exclusively in the head. Part of what we understand now is that there is this interaction between the brain and the body, and that stress isn't located exclusively in the brain. Stress emanates from the body, is registered in the body, and the connection between the gut and the brain, between uh, the, the more primitive functions of the brain and adrenal responses is far more complex. And, and, and so stress is real, right? And, and, and you can do tests in, in, in which you expose someone um, subconsciously to, to a stimulation that the conscious brain cannot register, right? But, but it's a, a stimuli that represents a danger or a threat. You show them for a fraction of a section of a second uh, an image of uh, a predatory animal that would be a threat to us, and you find, even though they have no awareness that they've seen it, 
that the body has a fight or flight response, right? And so there's parts of the brain that we're not consciously aware of that are processing stressors and preparing our body for what comes next. And, and what seems to be the case is that white working class Americans, this data, by the way, is for all white Americans. And, and, and what you see here is, right, that uh, after going down and down, right, this is deaths per 100,000. So, so how many people are dying in the United States each year? For US white non-Hispanics with advances in medicine and nutrition, uh, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, deaths were going down in parallel with the way they were going down in other societies from the 1990s through the 2000s. Then in the 2000s, a, a, a discrepancy began to open up, right? And then by the time you get to the more recent period, essentially, the uh, death rate has stabilized as opposed to going down, despite the advances in medicine that are occurring. And when you compare us with Ireland, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, right, these are the Anglo communities in the world, everywhere else is seeing a steady decrease in deaths per 100,000, whereas the United States is the outlier. So, so what, what's going on is something specific to the white working class reflected in both mortality and morbid, morbidity data. And we, we begin to, to see uh, that it's a specifically working class problem when we look at who is actually having increases in deaths. And, and one of the interesting things that Case and Deaton did in their research is they tried to identify various surrogates for class. Um, is it income? Is it wealth? Is it education? And they determined that the most important marker, the most important way to measure class in the United States is actually education. And although they originally used a kind of threefold distinction, high school degree or less, some college, BA or more, they came to the conclusion that the big divide in the United States is really just who has a college degree and who doesn't. So it's BA or less BA or more, right? And what you see is I think quite interesting because obviously people without BAs are dying much more frequently than people with college degrees. But in addition to that, there's a, there's a racial dimension to this, right? And, and so we're talking about both educational level and race. And uh, if you just look at it in terms of race alone, what you see again is that for white Americans, after declining quite uh, substantially from the 1970s to around 2000, things stabilized and actually went up a little. For African Americans, things have been going down and down and down consistently. So, so how do we explain this discrepancy that is both an educational and a race discrepancy. And the simple, I think, answer is that white Americans, more than black Americans, expected that they would have continuing upward mobility. And when that expectation was dashed by economic trends out of their control, they were much more traumatized, much more exposed to stress, much more demoralized by what was occurring to them. And, and uh, as, as I say in this slide, there's almost nothing funny about this, but Gary Trudeau and Doonesbury managed to, to find a little bit of humor about this. This is a cartoon from 2017 um, in, in which he has uh, right, a, a white man and an African American man talking with each other, uh, reading the newspaper on some seemingly pretty luxurious porch. Uh, the white man saying uh, they're called deaths of despair from drugs, alcohol, or suicide driven by economic and social distress. Oddly, it doesn't seem to affect blacks or Latinos. The African American man says, Nothing odd about it, man. We've always lived distressed lives. We're used to it. White man says, so black privilege? Absolutely. 
we're lucky that way. And, and, and uh, this is obviously a, a joke, an effort to get some humor out of this, but there's real insight in this as well, which is that because African-Americans never had the expectation of perpetual upward mobility, they were much less subject to the stress induced by the sudden collapse of the economic, political, and social circumstances that were undergirding that expectation. And so when they became suddenly economically precarious, they experienced it as a loss of status, a loss of standing. And Case and Deaton, when they described this, um, talk about this as the very pillar of the white working class existence collapsed out from under them. And, and so I wanna say just a little bit more about this for a minute. And, and what I wanna refer to in particular is the role that work was playing in not only securing the economic viability, but also the social standing of the white working class. And so part of this just has to do with the experience of going to work every day in the same location with the same people and knowing that that work uh, both is economically rewarding in a way that allows you to be economically secure, not only own a home and pay it off, but also pay for your children's education, secure economic mobility for them for the next generation, take occasional vacations, own a decent car, right? All of the kind of markers of economic respectability in our society. It's also the case that that job constitutes a community, right? These are the same people you work with day in, day out. They respect you. They mirror back to you the way in which you see yourself, right? They say, we're all in this together and we're valued by our society for the work we're doing. And, and, and so work is not just a place you go to get income. It's a place you go to get meaning, recognition, economic status. And although many of the white working class people who have been severely affected in ways that we've talked about by the emergence of a post-industrial, post-manufacturing economy, who are no longer working at the steel plant or the automobile plant, but instead are getting temporary, flexible jobs at a Starbucks or a Walmart or Amazon, right? They're, they're not going to work the same hours. Their hours vary week by week. They're not seeing the same people. They may be jumping job to job to job and they don't feel that the work that they're doing represents an important and meaningful contribution to our society or is rewarded as such in terms of its compensation and benefits. And so it's not just that they've been rendered economically precarious, it's also that their sense of social integration and belonging has been undermined because of the collapse of work. And Case and Deaton point out that not only are they no longer going to the kinds of jobs that was integral to the way they thought of themselves, their other main social institutions have also collapsed. One of them was the union. And I think, again, it's worthwhile to think of the union not only in economic, but also in social terms. The union was not just an organization that allowed you to get a better deal in terms of your wages to bargain uh, with your employer. It was also a place that had a union hall that sponsored summer camps, that did political organizing, that had internal elections. And, and so it was another institution of belonging. And similarly, the third major institution in white working class life was the church. And, and what Case and Deaton find, and they draw on a lot of anthropological work as well, is that um, a lot 
of the white working class people whose economic situation has been drastically called into question by the changes in the economy have stopped going to church. And, and I think part of this is that they may be ashamed of aspects of their behavior. We know that alcoholism, drug abuse, and spousal and child abuse have all gone up dramatically in these regions as a result of the increased economic stress. And if you're doing that kind of stuff, maybe you don't wanna show your face at an institution where you're accountable for your moral conduct. But it's also the case, again, thinking about belonging to a community that mirrors back to you the way you see yourself, that the people who would be going to church want to be seen as respectable, upstanding members of their community. And when they don't have stable, secure, work with benefits that pays them decently when they've had to sell their house and downsize or can't afford a decent car or their children are having trouble, they may not want to be seen in public in that way. And so in all these respects, then the situation that, 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 that Doonesbury is kind of making light of is actually quite serious and, 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 and quite painful for the people involved and it's explaining these higher rates of mortality. Now, I, I want to kind of move away from Case and Deaton's details and into a more general framework for thinking about this. And I wanna think about how inequality works and how sometimes it's offset or countered. And, and so I, I wanna start building on Charles Tilley's work on durable inequality now, uh, as well as some other work that goes all the way back to um, Rousseau and Tocqueville. And, and, and so uh, I'm going to call your attention to the title of, of a book by Jonathan Metzl that I, I have not actually had the time to go through yet, but Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland. And I, I think this really captures a lot of what I want to say to you uh, about what's been happening to the white working class. And I want to start by talking about Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his analysis of the way in which inequality is stabilized in a kind of cycle of reinforcing inequality or self-reinforcing inequality. This is in a, a work by Rousseau called The Discourse on the Nature and Origin of Inequality. Um, it's uh, sometimes just called the second discourse. And Rousseau starts from the idea that there's an accidental development that generates an initial inequality. This is a, a, a work of imagined history. And Rousseau imagines, for instance, that at some point in human history, we discovered metallurgy, how to, how to make tools out of metal, and that the people who could do that all of a sudden became wealthier than everyone else, right? And, and then there's this related idea that once you or your family or your group have figured out how to do something of particular social value, it's an almost natural human tendency to want to try to hoard that opportunity, to just try to prevent other people from competing with you for it, to try to close them out of the competition, maybe even close their children out so that your children can secure that advantage as well. You can think of this all the way back to the Bible and the idea that if your last name is Helveticus, you can be a priest. And if it's not, you can't. You can think about it in terms of contemporary examples. If, if you get an Ivy League degree, then you have access to the white shoe law firm. If you don't, then you don't. An Ivy League law degree, that is, right? And, and, and so these are various ways in which people try to keep others from competing with them. And often it's, it's not just the case that we do this in a kind of you can't compete obvious gross way, but we, we construct uh, social and psychological categories 
that rationalize and then lead people to internalize the idea that there's a certain kind of person who has access and a certain kind of person who doesn't have access to these goods. If your name is Helveticus, then you have some sort of capacity to communicate with God or interpret his holy texts and guide your community. If it isn't, then you don't have that capacity. And if we start letting you be a priest, we're gonna be in trouble, right? We're gonna lose God's favoring grace. Uh, and, and right, you can think of that in terms of education. If you got a Harvard or a Yale degree, you must be among the best and the brightest. And then, of course, we wanna hire you. If, if you got a degree from a lowly state university of New York, then, well, you're, you're a notch or two below us and we're probably not going to take you very seriously, right? And, and so there's this effort to create social categories that are marked in particular ways. Once this is done, we get a kind of consolidation of an unequal distribution of advantages and privileges. Only those people get to do this. Those people are not allowed to do this. And of course, we can think of race and gender as being extremely important ways of, of marking categories of people. One of the things, as I was saying, Charles Tilley writes about when he's writing about this, and I'm attributing this to Rousseau, but I'm fleshing it out using other thinkers' ideas. Um, he, he looks at the um, effective monopoly that Korean Americans established over bodegos, uh, corner stores in New York City in the middle of the 20th century. And he, he points, I guess it's the 1970s in particular that this happened. He points out that, that running a bodego is not a particularly glamorous form of work. It, it's not especially lucrative either. Uh, but it does allow people to eke out a stable income and to have a kind of niche in the economy. Other examples that Tilly points to is the control that Chinese Americans have over the laundry and dry cleaning industry in many cities, or the way in which Latin Americans, especially Mexican Americans, have uh, dominance in the back end of the restaurant, right? Dishwashers, busboys, et cetera. Um, and that in fact, ethnic networks are very effective at distributing these kind of low end economic positions. That once the Koreans have started to establish this network, they help other Koreans work with landlords to get leases. They have lawyers they work with, they have suppliers they work with, and they support each other. They actually have informal networks for giving each other loans, right? And so once you have this effort to secure the uh, closure of the opportunity, a stereotype develops, right? Um, Chinese Americans do a good job running the laundromat. That's a place we want to go. And then the advantage gets consolidated and then we have a reinforced durable inequality. And that feeds back into the initial inequality, the ability to hoard it, and the stereotype. Um, and um, I'll be getting back to our white working class Americans in, in, in just a minute. But I want to kind of develop the Rousseauian idea a little bit more. You can see, right, initial inequality, an effort to hoard and secure it, followed by the creation of social categories that have a kind of psychological plausibility to them. Then how does that work of consolidation operate? What are the institutions? It might operate within the family, girls and boys are educated and trained in different ways to expect different things from society. It might operate through the school, right? The, 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 the teachers in the school uh, have different gender or racial stereotypes, or alternatively, they just recognize you seem to be from that good, well-educated middle-class family. You seem to be from a working-class family. They're implicitly sorting you and categorizing you. Once you get into the workplace, gender, racial, educational, 
class stereotypes steer you, the so-called glass ceiling, right? That, that women are good at a certain level, but not so good once they get into the upper levels of management. Uh, state policy may reinforce this, and there are all kinds of examples of state policy reinforcing economic inequality in our society, especially along racial dimensions. You may or may not know that when Social Security was created, in order to get Southern Democrats to vote for it, FDR agreed not to let typically black lines of employment qualify for social security. So to this day, railway porters are not qualified to get social security benefits because that was what was necessary to uh, get the new deal passed and get white democratic Southern support for it. The real estate market might be another institution. I, I hope you're getting the picture here, right? Which is to say, when we talk about the creation of durable inequalities, it's almost always the interaction of multiple institutions that serve to consolidate the inequality that has been at first created maybe even accidentally, right? There's nothing that says Koreans are going to be good at owning corner stores. It just so happened accidentally at some period that was a pattern that developed. Uh, but once it developed uh, stereotypes, but also institutions reinforce that pattern. Now, I, I want to point to an alternative alternative kind of pattern. And this is one that was described by Alexis de Tocqueville, Rousseau's French compatriot, who wrote about a hundred years after Rousseau wrote his discourse on the origins of inequality in his work, Democracy in America, about what he saw as being so different in America than what he was seeing in France of his time. And Tocqueville described a different kind of cycle, one in which there was an initial movement toward social equality. And he pointed out that the United States had at least two very important factors. On the one hand, it had land, right? And, and so if you were unhappy with your economic position, go west, young man, there's places for you to go to get upward mobility. It wasn't like Europe where all the land was already taken usually by the nobility. And also related to that is the fact that the Americans didn't have a hereditary aristocracy. Anyone could become rich and that's all that really mattered for social standing. So there's this initial uh, movement towards social equality that comes from Europeans coming to this continent, and that then gives rise to a normative expectation of equal treatment. Tocqueville loved a particular example. He, he, he liked looking at the relationship between a master and a servant in France and in America. And he said, in France, when you have a master and a servant interacting with each other, the master probably is from generations back always been a master, right? His family, his parents, his grandparents, his great grandparents. And on the other hand, the servant probably for generations back has always been a servant, right? And at the same time, Tocqueville suggests the master expects that he will be a master till his dying day. And the servant expects that he will be a servant till his dying day. And as a result, there's a hierarchy. There's a kind of condescension from the master, a kind of deference from the servant that says, these are fixed social positions between which there is distance and domination. You will always be subordinate. You will always be superior. That's the way this society is structured. Whereas in America, not only is it the case that the master didn't come from a generation long chain of masters. It's also the case that the master typically often started life as a servant. 
right, as not particularly well off and gain their wealth and their standing over the course of their successful career. Whereas the servant, although they're currently a servant, does not expect to stay servile for the rest of their life. Quite to the contrary, expects that they too, by the end of their career, will have attained the kind of economic success that allows them to have servants catering to them and hence makes them a master. And that the result is that in the United States, servants and masters essentially regard each other as equals and that the servant does not expect condescension and the master does not expect servility from the master or the servant, right? They, they relate to each other as equals. They expect equal treatment. And Tocqueville came to America in the 1830s in the Jacksonian period, and he noted, look, this is not just a, a, a difference in the level of equality in their, in their society or a difference in what, how they expect to be treated. This is leading to reforms. He pointed to two in particular. One of them was reforms in suffrage or voting qualifications. And right in the 1830s, the US eliminated any kind of property qualification for the vote. And Tocqueville said, that makes sense, right? Because people no longer view lacking property as fundamentally marking them as inherently inferior to people who have property. They have much more egalitarian expectations. The other reform had to do with inheritance and the idea that wealth was not passed down from the family to the firstborn son. So it all stayed together. Instead, the default inheritance norm in the United States was equal division of property among all children, right? And that meant that everybody in the family was equal as opposed to you trying to set one person up to be very powerful, right? And, and so once you have these reforms in place, well, you're saying to people, you're politically and economically equal, that's going to lead to greater equality, greater expectations of equality, and you get a kind of virtuous, self-reinforcing cycle as opposed to the vicious spiral of inequality that you had with Rousseau. And again, we can develop this more sociologically and see in particular what are the kinds of reforms that would do the work here. Tocqueville focused on inheritance and voting, but we can look at educational opportunity. If we equalize educational opportunity, one of the really important stories to be told about what happened with the white working class in America in the middle of the 20th century is the GI Bill and the way in which the GI Bill gave the essentially right to attend college to all returning enlisted men right? And, and the huge growth in the educational sector, the building of state universities as a result. The GI Bill also gave mortgage support to enlisted men. And so this made it possible for um, the middle class, even the working class, to aspire to home ownership. The beginning of the 20th century, fewer than 10% of Americans owned their homes. By the time you get to the 1960s, it's almost two thirds of Americans. Used to be you needed to have 50% of the value of a home to purchase it. That was your down payment. By the time you get to the 1960s, often it's 10% due to federal mortgage insurance in the GI Bill, right? Uh, due to the intergenerational effects of that in which parents would then help their children to buy homes, housing became much more affordable. Uh, ownership became much more common. Campaign finance reform, so that it's not the case that only the wealthy are represented in Congress. Redistributive taxation, I will point out to you later in this course that the average tax rate on the wealthiest people in this country from the 1930s through the 1970s was 80%, right? 
Right now it's in the high 20, low 30%. So, so we've cut the average tax rate uh, by more than 50%, almost by two thirds. Uh, and, and, and that lets larger inequalities accumulate. Alternatively, redistributive taxation counteracts the accumulation of wealth within a single generation. Pro-union policies in ways that we've talked about uh, increase the bargaining power of labor and welfare support helps those who lose their jobs not to become desperately poor. And, and so now I, I think we've got a, a better understanding of what happened with the white working class. And, and, and I'm gonna uh, pause in just a minute for questions if you have them, but I, I just wanna round this out, which is to say that the, the white working class in the middle of the 20th century were beneficiaries of that kind of Tocquevillian cycle. And it's the white working class, not the entire working class, that's the beneficiary of that cycle. And, and they were the beneficiary of a whole suite of policies that allowed them to attain much greater equality, not only economic, but social, a sense that they were fully contributing, fully equal members of our society, and that sense led them to support institutions like uh, progressive taxation and unions that then allowed that equality to be socially secured. And uh, again, let, let me just uh, develop this a little bit more because when we begin to combine the Rousseauian and the Tocquevillian perspective, one of the things we'll see is that uh, often, right, there, there's a movement towards social equality, normative expectation of equal treatment, but then there are social dynamics that threaten to reassert inequality. So uh, unequal returns on capital and wages, right? If the people who own stocks are making a lot more money than the people who work for wages, if you don't do something to counteract that, say pro-union policies and redistributive taxation, then you may get the inequality threatening to reemerge. Um, unequal, I'm sorry, educational access. I know that's hard to read. It's hard for me to read. Racism and sexism, right? These are other dynamics. And so you need pro-union policies. You need educational policy opportunity. You need affirmative action. When we fully develop the picture, we see that even in a moment of greater social equality, there are forces lurking in society that will upend the equality if they're not counteracted. And to be direct and honest, I think part of what happened in the last 20 years of the 20th century is that the white working class lost track of what the forces were that secured their equality. They stopped supporting these kinds of countervailing measures. They came to accept a myth, the myth of merit that said that we're responsible for our economic success. We deserve it, we merit it because of our hard work. And when I say that, I don't mean that they don't merit their economic success, but I do mean that they also need these institutions to secure it. It's not enough to be a hardworking member of the white working class to secure your equality, your economic security, your standing in society that has to be legally secured. And in a democracy, you need to support the parties and institutions that secure it. And for various reasons, the white working class stopped doing that. And the result is that we very quickly returned to a kind of Rousseauian cycle in which there was, as opposed to uh, institutions that secure equality, institutions that reinforce inequality. And so what we see when we see the deaths of despair is the fact that white workers in the United States thought that they deserved and merited their 
economic security, their social standing, their benefits, their intergenerational mobility, but did not see that if they did not continue to vote and act in ways that secured it, they were going to very quickly suffer downward economic mobility. I will stop there. Um, I know I've, I've now got a lot of you online. Uh, I'm gonna open it up so uh, your microphones will be live now. Uh, try to um, see if you can keep the background noise down so we can all hear each other. Who wants to start I, us out Dr. with a question? Parrott, I have a question. Go ahead, I was go always under, oh. do you hear me? I do, who is this? Harriet. Oh, hi Harriet, go ahead. Hi. I was always under the impression that if you qualified uh, economically, that you received Social Security. I didn't know there was any prejudice attached to it in any way. So do you know any school teachers, Harriet? Of course, I was one. And did you get Social Security for your work as a school teacher? Certainly. Interesting. Okay, so so maybe it varies state by state. I know in California that the uh, school teachers do not get Social Security. They get a pension instead. Um, and uh, the, the same thing. Really? Pardon? Wait a minute. I get Social Security and a pension. And do you, did you work in any other uh, line of work, Harriet? No. Okay, so, so so it might be different state by state, or it might be right. were you married? And, well, this and, was this. Hold on, this was New York City. I don't know if that's different. Yeah, it, it might be different. But but what I'll tell you, and and um, I, unfortunately, I don't have the book with me. But but there's a, a wonderful book. Um, I'll, I'll put it in the in the chat bar uh, by um, Ira Katz Nelson, um, and uh, the book is called when affirmative action was white. Um, and this is a history of the New Deal. And uh, in this history of the New Deal, he points out exactly the story that I was telling. And so it's not just um, railroad porters, uh, uh, domestic workers, um, daycare providers, the, there were under Social Security in the way that the legislation was structured in 1930. Uh, all, oh, the, that's what I'm whole, thinking. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, a whole series of lines of work that were disqualified from getting the benefit. Now, having said that, some of that has been revised in the intervening years, right? And 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 so uh, the, the, there has been reform, but the reason it was. Uh, put in place was because white Southern Democrats, primarily in the Senate, said, we will not vote for any piece of legislation that suggests that whites and blacks have equal social standing in our society. And I thought that President, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. I thought this was a federal mandated situation, it social is security. Good. It, it, it is, but this is the origin of the federal legislation, right? FDR knew he couldn't get this passed through the Senate without support from Southern Democrats. And so he amended the legislation when it was still being drafted to get their support by taking out certain professions because those professions were seen by white Southerners as being dominantly black professions and they did not want them to qualify for social security. I know it's it, 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 from, from a 2020 perspective, it's shocking that, that this it's was amazing, the case. Yeah. And especially because I think so many of us have such high esteem for FDR. The idea That's that right. he was, you know, uh, willing to trade the rights of African Americans in order to get Social Security passed is God. disappointing, God. to say the least, right? And that's why Ira Katz Nelson, the great historian at Columbia University, wrote that book. Um, and, and he wrote an, an, another book uh, called Nothing to Fear, which is a much more systematic uh, history 
of uh, the New Deal in which he also told aspects of, of this story. But when affirmative action was white, has the detailed story of this. Um, thank you for the that's comment, a, Harriet. Lois, you're raising your hand, right? Great, this is my greatest revelation to me. I would have never have known this. Um, well, if you, if you Google that book, I think you'll find some good information about it. Yeah, ahead, I'm sure. I Raquette Nelson was at the new school when I was there. He was the dean of the graduate faculty. Um, anyhow, what my uh, question really is, in the very beginning, you met throughout the word trust. It never came up again uh, in your discussion. But um, my sense is that um, the lower middle, that, that group, the white lower middle class group that has all these problems and low and inequality and whatever, they lost their, they lost their trust in what, um, what society was uh, doing to them and to everyone else. And that idea of, of trust um, to me has something to do with the way they react to, to government and policy and, and to the inequality that exists that, that, that they go deeper and deeper because they don't trust anything happening. But I don't know, that's... I would yeah, well, so, well, let me elaborate a, a little bit on, on your point because yeah. I do think it's a good point. And, and, and you know, I, I didn't do everything I wanted to do today. I, I covered a lot of material with you. I, I hope it's making sense, but... Um, it does. Uh, Wonderful. One of the, the issues with the white working class um, is that if, if you look at the, the survey data, if you look at the more anthropological work on them uh, from the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, um, they had a differentiated sense of desert, right, or merit, that, that the white working class deserved or merited its position in our society and that they were beneficiaries of programs like social security or public education that were universally available to everyone. Whereas African Americans, Latinos, recent immigrants, they were beneficiaries of welfare, right? Where that came to be a loaded term, right? That meant something you didn't work for, something you didn't earn. And, and that they, uh, then came to do things, frankly, that were damaging to themselves because they became convinced, especially in the 1980s under Ronald Reagan and then going forward from there, that um, the very institutions which benefited them, things like pro-union legislation and minimum wage legislation, were designed primarily to benefit people who were less deserving than they were, especially racial minorities. Uh, and, and so they withdrew their support for the very basis for their own economic security and social standing. And you're absolutely right. When, when Ronald Reagan, when, when I think of him, I think of two slogans in particular. One of them is that the Democrats declared war on poverty and poverty won, right? Yeah. And, and, and again, not accurate. And especially what's missed out in that is the degree to which white working class people won from the war on poverty and the New Deal. And, and the second is that government is not part of the solution. Government is part of the problem. And again, missing out on the ways in which um, this was so important that the, 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 the legislative support for equality was so important to um, the economic mobility and security that the white working class experienced in the post-war years. So yes, I, I, I do think in a sense, the, the, the white working class stopped trusting the very institutions that were responsible for their quite miraculous upward mobility in the post-war period. Yeah. It's not as simple as all that globalization, automation, 
immigration, that there are other factors that also come into the story. But part of the question is, why didn't we continue the political fight that, uh, that secured equality as the social circumstances change, right? Why didn't we continue to do what Tocqueville kind of predicted we would do, which would be to evolve the institutions that secure equality and counteract emerging th threats of inequality instead of, um, uh, in essence, abandoning support for this whole suite of equality securing institutions. Thank you for the good question, Lois. Anybody else with a question or a comment at this point? All right, we've had a nice long discussion today. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we got up to the, the numbers. It took us a few minutes, but it's good to see everybody here now. I'm just gonna say, take care, continue to be safe. Hope you're able to, as we were talking about at the beginning, get outside a little bit and get some fresh air. Hopefully things just keep getting a little bit better at a time, but, but please be safe and smart uh, with the way you, you handle yourselves. Take care, everybody. Have a good weekend. I'll see you Bye. next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Take care.